Hi, everybody. This is the beginning of the book, The City of Ember by Jean Duprow. And at the very beginning of our file, what you'll find is a map of the actual city of Ember. And you'll notice in some ways it's very similar to other cities. You know, it looks like there's a town square and there's a clock tower. Uh, it looks like there's a prison. Um, and so there are a lot of geographical landscapes that will look similar to us. I want you to notice what you don't see. You're not seeing a water supply, right? We're not seeing a lake or a pond of any kind. Um, there are certain things that are missing that maybe we would have. So things like, you know, parks uh, don't really seem to be part of this map. Uh, you'll also notice if you look in the lower left corner where we have that little compass right there, um, it shows us that there's something called the unknown regions. And that would imply that there's parts of this particular place that are still unexplored. And that seems kind of interesting and exciting because we very much live in a world that's fully explored. Um, you know, there's there's not a lot left to our world that people haven't seen at some point in human history. Uh, but this, this place is a little bit different. So with that, uh, let's get involved in the city of Ember. You'll notice that there is also a map of what's called the Pipeworks. It's a really blurry image, but what we can see is that there is an intricate system of pipes. So we know they do have some source of water in this city. Our first chapter is actually an introductory chapter, and it's rather short. But as we are reading through it, we are going to try and keep track of some details. Because unlike other books that we've read together this year, the big mystery to begin with is the setting. Exactly where is this city? So let's read on and find out. The instructions. When the city of Ember was just built and not yet inhabited, the chief builder and the assistant builder, both of them weary, sat down to speak of the future. They must not leave the city for at least 200 years, said the chief builder, or perhaps 220 is that long enough? asked his assistant. It should be. We can't know for sure. And when the time comes, said the assistant, how will they know what to do? We'll provide them with instructions, of course, the chief builder replied. But who will keep the instructions? Who can we trust to keep them safe and secret all that time? The mayor of the city, We'll keep the instructions, said the chief builder. We'll put them in a box with a timed lock set to open on the proper date. And will we tell the mayor what's in the box? The assistant asked. No, just that it's information they won't need and must not see until the box opens of its own accord. So the first mayor will pass the box to the next mayor and that one to the next and so on down through the years. All of them keeping it secret all of that time. What else can we do? Asked the chief builder. Nothing about this endeavor is certain. There may be no one left in the city by then or no safe place for them to come back to. So the first mayor of Ember was given the box, told to guard it carefully and solemnly sworn to secrecy. When she grew old, and her time as mayor was up, she explained about the box to her successor, who also kept the secret carefully, as did the next mayor. Things went as planned for many years, but the seventh mayor of Ember was less honorable than the ones who had come before him, and more desperate. He was ill. He had the coughing sickness that was common in the city then, and he thought the box might hold a secret that would save his life. He took it from its hiding place in the basement of the gathering hall and brought it home with him, where he attacked it with a hammer. But his strength was failing by then. All he managed to do was dent the lid a little. And before he could return the box to its official hiding place or tell his successor about it, he died. The box ended up at the back of a closet, shoved behind some old bags and bundles where it sat 
unnoticed, year after year, until its time arrived, and the lock quietly clicked open. So in the instructions chapter, we're given an interesting premise. We have a builder and an assistant builder. And these two characters, we will not see again for this entire story. Uh, but they seem critically important to the plot because they're the ones who have created this place. Ember was built by these two men or women. I don't know. They don't really give us a gender, do they? Um, so we are looking at a city that was designed to hold people for 200, 220 years. So for me as a reader, I'm asking myself, what happened? What happened that we or wherever this society is needed to basically be locked into a place for hundreds of years in order to emerge safely. And so this is something that as a reader, that's my first mystery I want to tackle. Um, you know, aside from where is this place? When is this place? What happened that this place was necessary? So this is the city. This is the setup for why this city exists as it does. And it does bring our attention back to the map that this is some place that was built very deliberately by these two builders. Um, I'm sure they had more builders than just the two of them, but these two main builders. So the gathering hall that they talked about the box being kept in is right there in the center of the city. Uh, wherever the mayor lived, it doesn't really tell us, but wherever that critical box is with instructions is somewhere in this city. And uh, we simply just don't know where yet, okay? Now, with that being said, we're going to move into the actual narrative part of the story, which involves two main characters. Now, at this point, it might be a good idea for you to have your character chart open. Uh, that's one of the documents that was posted for you today, uh, Monday the 27th. And uh, it's there with the names of characters pre uh, listed for you so that you know when you come across someone important enough to note. OK, uh, just like last time, you're going to write down descriptions of the characters, not just physical, but also their personality traits uh, and key events that happen that kind of change that character's life. The new addition of an extra column, we're not going to worry about that extra column until the end of the book. So I don't want you to panic about I don't understand you know, static, dynamic, round, flat. That will be an entire lesson that I will give you happily uh, before we get to the end of the book. So we have chapter one, assignment day. In the city of Ember, the sky was always dark. The only light came from the great flood lamps mounted on the buildings and at the tops of poles in the middle of the large squares. When the lights were on, they cast a yellowish glow over the streets. People walking by threw long shadows that shortened and then stretched out again. When the lights were off, as they were between nine at night and six in the morning, the city was so dark that people might as well have been wearing blindfolds. So just from the standpoint of visualization, which is a skill we literally just worked on uh, with our one pager, this gives us a lot to imagine, right? So I want you to try to picture in your mind a place that's always dark, uh, that's only lit by flood lamps. So think about the kind of lights that you see around the football field at Suffern Middle School. Um, if you've ever been in a large warehouse store, think about the way that's lit, someplace like a Costco or a BJ's, where they have those lights overhead. Uh, and then it talks about the idea that when the lights were on, people had this yellowish glow over them and they threw long shadows, right? So it's lit, but it's not even brightly lit. It's not as bright as a typical day for us, okay? And then it tells us the lights go off from nine at night until six in the morning. So it is pitch black. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever gone camping, but when you're away from city lights uh, and it's it's really, really dark, even the stars don't do the job of lighting things up 
uh, quite as clearly as you might like. Um, it can be really scary. But this is the norm in this city of Ember, which we know was built by the founders. So um, with that in mind, I want you to keep that picture in your head of this place that's almost warehousey in its lighting. It's almost, uh, you know, almost it's dimly lit for most of the time, but it's it's almost cavernous when the lights are out. Sometimes darkness fell in the middle of the day. The city of Ember was old and everything in it, including the power lines, was in need of repair. So now and then the lights would flicker and go out. These were terrible moments for the people of Ember. As they came to a halt in the middle of the street or stood stock still in their houses, afraid to move in the utter blackness, they were reminded of something they preferred not to think about, that someday the lights of the city might go out and never come back on. So that right there, that seems like a conflict to me. What kind of conflict do you guys think this is? Character versus what? If you said technology, you've got it. Because it's not society that creates this problem. It's the failing of the technology. It's the failing of the lights, okay? So whatever uh, lighting system they've been using is no longer working the way it was designed to work. Okay, let's continue. But most of the time, life proceeded as it always had. Grown people did their work and younger people until they reached the age of 12 went to school. On the last day of their final year, which was called assignment day, they were given jobs to do. So it's kind of interesting. People who are your age or even younger, right? Some of you are 13 at this point. Um, they are given their career path at the end of eighth grade, which is a little scary, right? The idea that you're going to join the adult workforce at your age is kind of intimidating because it's just not what we do. The graduating students occupied room eight of the Ember School. On assignment day of the year 241, this classroom, usually noisy first thing in the morning, was completely silent. All 24 students sat upright and still at the desks they had grown too big for. They were waiting. So I don't know if you caught this. The year is 241. How long were they supposed to keep this city running, according to our builder and our assistant builder? That's right. It was supposed to be 200 to 220 years, and they are now... 21 years past what they were supposed to be in that city. So whatever happened to that box of instructions, they don't know about it. And ultimately, that's the problem. That's why they're trapped in this city that's failing, because the city was not designed to last that long. The desks were arranged in four rows of six, one behind the other. In the last row sat a slender girl named Lena Mayfleet. She was winding a strand of her long, dark hair around her finger, winding and unwinding it back again and again. Sometimes she plucked at a thread on her ragged cape or bent over to pull up her socks, which were loose and tended to slide down around her ankles. One of her feet tapped the floor softly. So our first character on the character chart is Lena. If we're putting down details about her appearance, she has long, dark hair. She's slender. Okay. Uh, it seems like what she's wearing is ragged. Okay. Let's continue. In the second row was a boy named Dune Harrow. He sat with his shoulders hunched, his eyes squeezed shut in concentration, and his hands clasped tightly together. His hair looked rumpled as if he hadn't combed it for a while. He had dark, thick eyebrows, which made him look serious at the best of times, and, when he was anxious or angry, came together to form a straight line across his forehead. His brown corduroy jacket was so old that its ridges had flattened out. So again, we are presented with a character. This is another one that's on the character chart. Dune Harrow is a protagonist, as is Lena Mayfleet. Okay, um, this kid's shoulders are hunched. Uh, he's got clasped hands, fists, 
that are clasped together tightly. So that would indicate somebody who's maybe nervous, anxious, right? Uh, rumpled hair, thick eyebrows that are dark, S looked serious, even at the best of times. And when he's anxious or angry, his eyebrows form one straight line like Bert from Bert and Ernie on Sesame Street. Okay. Um, and his clothes also seem to be a little bit tattered because we've got a corduroy jacket. That's That's that material that's kind of bumpy. It's got ridges in it. All the ridges had flattened out. That's how old his jacket is. Both the girl and the boy were making urgent wishes. Dune's wish was very specific. He repeated it over and over again, his lips moving slightly as if he could make it come true by saying it a thousand times. Lena was making her wish in pictures rather than in words. In her mind's eye, she saw herself running through the streets of the city in a red jacket. She made this picture as bright and real as she could. So it seems like they each have a goal that they would like to reach on assignment day. They each have something in mind that they wish to do for the rest of their lives. But it also seems like they don't have a certainty that this will happen. So there's a certain amount of, um, of you know, anxiety involved here because they're not really sure what their careers are going to turn out to be. Lena looked up and gazed around the schoolroom. She said a silent goodbye to everything that had been familiar for so long. Goodbye to the map of the city of Ember in its scarred wooden frame and the cabinet whose shelves held the book of numbers, the book of letters, and the book of the city of Ember. Goodbye to the cabinet drawers labeled new paper and old paper. Goodbye to the three electric lights in the ceiling that seemed always, no matter where you sat, to cast the shadow of your head over the page you were writing on. And goodbye to their teacher, Miss Thorne, who had finished her last day of school speech, wishing them luck in the lives that they were about to begin. Now, having run out of things to say, she was standing at her desk with her frayed shawl clasped around her shoulders. And still, the mayor, the guest of honor, had not arrived. So this gives us a nice uh, description. And again, I want you to visualize this. I want you to picture in your head that we've got a schoolroom and it seems very basic. It's got the map of the city of Ember. It's got bookshelves, which aren't full of tons of books. We've got, it seems, three books, right? We've got a file cabinet with just blank paper that's new and old paper, so paper that's been used, but at some point they intend to reuse, it seems. Three electric lights in the ceiling um, that, again, cast shadows. So this is a dimly lit one, one room situation. Um, the fact that they're in room eight would lead you to believe that there were room seven and six and five before that, so that it seems like a smallish school if you can fit your entire eighth grade, all 24 of them in one classroom. Someone's foot scraped back and forth on the floor. Miss Thorne sighed. Then the door rattled open and the mayor walked in. He looked annoyed as though they were the ones who were late. Welcome, Mayor Cole, said Miss Thorne. She held out her hand to him. The mayor made his mouth into a smile. Miss Thorne, he said, enfolding her hand. Greetings, another year. The mayor was a vast, heavy man, so big in the middle that his arms looked small and dangling. In one hand, he held a little cloth bag. He lumbered to the front of the room and faced the students. His gray, drooping face appeared to be made of something stiffer than ordinary skin. It rarely moved, except for making the smile that was on it now. So we have Mayor Cole on the character chart. You want to add some details about him. He's described as a vast, heavy man, big in the middle, small arms. Okay. Um, he seems to not really be sincere about what he's doing, if you notice that he, you know, seems annoyed when he comes in. So this idea that he suddenly is smiling uh, means that he may be acting a little more than, than what we would prefer, right? Um, he has a gray, drooping face, so he must be older, right? His skin seems to be stiff, uh, and it rarely moved, except for the smile that he has right now. So 
you've got that on your chart, you should be all set. Let's continue. Young people of the highest class, the mayor began. He stopped and scanned the room for several moments. His eyes seemed to look out from far back inside his head. He nodded slowly. Assignment day now, is it? Yes. First, we get our education. Then we serve our city. Again, his eyes moved back and forth along the rows of students, and again he nodded as if someone had confirmed what he said. He put the little bag on Miss Thorne's desk and rested his hand on it. What will that service be, eh? Perhaps you're wondering. He did his smile again, and his heavy cheeks folded like drapes. Lena's hands were cold. She wrapped her cape around her and pressed her hands between her knees. Please hurry, Mr. Mayor. She said silently, please just let us choose and get it over with. Dune, in his mind, was saying the same thing. Only he didn't say please. So this gives us the clue that we're kind of looking for in terms of how these jobs are assigned. This is not a society where people get to choose their careers. Instead, they literally are drawn at random, it seems, from this bag that the mayor has under his hand, right? So the little bag on the desk, um, they have to choose from it. And that seems like kind of a reckless way to determine how certain jobs are going to be done around the city. Um, most logical people would want to see the people who have a strength or a talent or an ability in a certain area do those jobs. But that is not how this society is run. So this is kind of the first time I want you to notice this city is not entirely logical. And there are going to be times when you, just being you, have better ideas than what it is these people are executing in the story. So keep track of that because I think it definitely is designed into the story that way. Um, and you'll see that Lena and Dune similarly will question some of the decisions made in the city as well. Um, the other thing I'm going to point out to you real quick is the idea that we do have literary devices popping up earlier on. We saw a little bit of a literary device when there was some alliteration. But right here we have his heavy cheeks folded like drapes. So we have a comparison. Cheeks being compared to drapes. We have the word like. So what do we have here? You got it. It's a simile. All right, let's continue. Something to remember, the mayor said, holding up one finger. The job you draw today is for three years, then evaluation. Are you good at your job? Fine, you may keep it. Are you unsatisfactory? Is there a greater need elsewhere? You will be reassigned. It is extremely important, he said, jabbing his finger at the class, for all work of Ember to be done, to be properly done. So this gives us a little bit more detail and insight as to how the system works. So what you draw in eighth grade becomes your career for three years. You'll undergo evaluation. If you're good at it, you get to keep it. If you're not, then they will reassign you. You don't get to choose. You don't get to decide. They decide where you belong based on it. So if you don't like the job that you're given, um, you may get stuck with it if you're tolerable at it, or you may end up with another job that might be worse. So um, the bottom line is what you individually want doesn't really factor into the way the careers are decided in Ember. He picked up the bag and pulled open the drawstring. So let us begin. Simple procedure. Come up one at a time. Reach into this bag. Take one slip of paper, read it out loud. He smiled and nodded. The flesh under his chin bulged in and out. Who cares to be first? No one moved. Lena stared down at the top of her desk. There was a long silence. Then Lizzie Bisco, one of Lena's best friends, sprang to her feet. I would like to be first. She said in her breathless, high voice. So Lizzie's on our character chart as well. She has a breathless, high voice. She's one of Lena's best friends. And she is the first one to draw from the bag. Let's see what happens. Good. Walk forward. 
Lizzie went to stand before the mayor. Because of her orange hair, she looked like a bright spark next to him. Now choose. The mayor held out the bag with one hand and put the other behind his back as if to show he would not interfere. Lizzie reached into the bag and withdrew a tightly folded square of paper. She unfolded it carefully. Lena couldn't see the look on Lizzie's face, but she could hear the disappointment in her voice as she read out loud, Supply Depot Clerk. Very good, said the mayor. A vital job. So, to Lizzie's part of our chart, we're going to want to add the detail that she has orange hair. This is a beautiful simile once again. She looked like a bright spark. So, her hair was so bright that it lit things up, apparently, right? Um, and... More important than anything, she's disappointed with the job choice. She's chosen supply clerk. It's not what she wanted to do, obviously. And uh, now she's disappointed. So that kind of shows us what happens and how quickly this moves when you go up and do the drawing. Lizzie trudged back to her desk. Lena smiled at her, but Lizzie made a sour face. Supply depot clerk wasn't a bad job, but it was a dull one. The supply depot clerks sat behind a long counter, took orders from the storekeepers of Ember, and sent the carriers down to bring up what was wanted from the vast network of storerooms beneath Ember's streets. The storerooms held supplies of every kind. Canned food, clothes, furniture, blankets, light bulbs, medicine, pots and pans, reams of paper, soap, more light bulbs, everything the people of Ember could possibly need. The clerk sat at their ledger books all day recording the orders that came in and the goods that went out. Lizzie didn't like to sit still. She would have been better suited to something else. So this shows us that idea that what you want doesn't really matter. It's worth adding on the character chart to Lizzie that she doesn't like to sit still. This is not an ideal job for her. It also gives us an idea of what underneath the city of Ember looks like. And if you think back to that Pipeworks map, we knew there was a network of pipes under Ember. There also is a network of storerooms. And as you would understand, um, not anybody can have access to those storerooms because you might run out of things, right? So these supply clerks serve an important purpose. They are there to make sure that nobody is taking all of one type of supply, okay? Lena thought, messenger maybe, the job Lena wanted for herself. Messengers ran through the city all day long, going everywhere, seeing everything. Next, said the mayor. This time, two people stood up at once, Orly Gordon and Chet Nome. Orly quickly sat down again and Chet approached the mayor. Now, these are two new characters. We don't have them on the chart. They're not going to be that significant. So let's keep going. Choose, young man the mayor said. Chet chose. He unfolded his scrap of paper. Electrician's helper, he read, and his wide face broke into a smile. Lena heard someone take a quick breath. <gasps> she looked over to see Dune pressing a hand against his mouth. You never knew each year exactly which jobs would be offered. Some years there were several good jobs like greenhouse helper, timekeeper's assistant, or messenger, and no bad jobs at all. Other years, jobs like pipeworks laborer, trash sifter, and mold scraper were mixed in. But there would always be at least one or two jobs for the electrician's helper. Fixing the electricity was the most important job in Ember. And more people worked at it than anything else. So, key detail, that idea that the electricity was what was keeping Ember functional. That's a big deal. And I want you to think about, I know we had a little bit of a blackout in parts of Suffern uh, about a week ago. Um, I want you to think about that. That was inconvenient wildly for a lot of you who are trying to get online and do your classwork and talk to your friends, uh, you know, just in terms of having, you know, a dishwasher to run or a TV to watch or, you know, anything like that. Um, a blackout's wildly inconvenient. So you could imagine when a whole city is dependent upon the electricity um, and it seems to be a little shaky, that it would be the most important priority in that society. Orly was next. 
she got the job of building repair assistant, which was a good job for Orly. She was a strong girl and she liked hard work. Vindy Chance was made a greenhouse helper. She gave Lena a big grin as she went back to her seat. She'll get to work with Clary, Lena thought. Lucky. So far, no one has picked a really bad job. Perhaps this time there would be no bad jobs at all. So greenhouse helper seems like it would be an important job as well, simply for the fact that um, the greenhouse is where their food uh, source, their vegetables are grown. Uh, in the storerooms under Ember, there seems to be canned food. But as you would imagine, you know, having some fresh fruits and vegetables, it would be kind of nice. And so that seems to be what the greenhouse is about. Clary is a character that you're going to see later on. Uh, she works in the greenhouse. We're not learning too much about her right now. The idea gave her courage. Besides, she had reached the point where the suspense was giving her a stomach ache. So as Vindy sat down, even before the mayor could say next, she stood up and stepped forward. The little bag was made of faded green material, gathered at the top with a black string. Lena hesitated a moment, then put her hand inside and fingered the bits of paper. Feeling as if she were stepping off a high building, she picked one. There's a nice simile feeling as if she were stepping off a high building, like she's jumping off a cliff, right? That kind of anxiety and panic, but you're going to do it because you know you have to. That's where she is. She unfolded it. The words were written in black ink in small, careful printing. Pipe works laborer, they said. She stared at them. Out loud, please, the mayor said. Pipe works laborer. Lena said in a choked whisper. Louder, said the mayor. Pipe works laborer, Lena said again, her voice loud and cracked. There was a sigh of sympathy from the class. Keeping her eyes on the floor, Lena went back to her desk and sat down. Pipe works laborers worked below the storerooms in the deep labyrinth of tunnels that contained embers, water, and sewer pipes. They spent their days stopping up leaks, and replacing pipe joints. It was wet, cold work. It could even be dangerous. A swift underground river ran throughout the pipe works, and every now and then someone fell into it and was lost. People were lost occasionally in the tunnels too if they strayed too far. Lena stared miserably down at a letter B someone had scratched into her desktop long ago. Almost anything would have been better than pipe works laborer. Greenhouse helper would have been her second choice. She imagined with longing the warm air and earthy smell of the greenhouse where she could have worked with Clary, the greenhouse manager, someone she had known all of her life. She would have been content as a doctor's assistant too, binding up cuts and bones. Even a street sweeper or cart puller would have been better. At least then she could have stayed above ground with space and people around her. She thought going down into the pipeworks must be like being buried alive. So if we're keeping track on our character chart of Lena, you got to make sure you put down her reaction that anything would have been better than a pipeworks laborer. This is what she's been given. She's not happy about it. Okay. She would have done anything else. Um, she thinks that going down into the pipeworks is like being buried alive. So it shows you she has a real sense of fear and dread and panic about this. It's not a job that she wants. Um, so we'll have to see how that plays out for her. We still have a protagonist who needs to draw, and that's Dune. So let's keep going. One by one, the other students chose their jobs. None of them got such a wretched job as hers. And finally, the last person rose from his chair and walked forward. It was Dune. His dark eyebrows were drawn together in a frown of concentration. His hands, Lena saw, were clenched into fists at his side. Dune reached into the bag and took out the last scrap of paper. He paused a minute, pressed it tightly in his hand. Go on, said the mayor. Read. Unfolding the paper, Dune read, Messenger. He scowled, crumpled the paper, and dashed it to the floor. Lena gasped. <gasps> The whole class rustled in surprise. Why would anyone be angry to get the job of messenger? Bad behavior, cried the mayor. His eyes bulged and his face darkened. Go to your seat immediately. 
Dune kicked the crumpled paper into a corner, and then he stalked back to his desk and flung himself down. The mayor took a short breath and blinked furiously. Disgraceful, he said, glaring at Dune. A childish display of temper. Students should be glad to work for their city. Ember will prosper if all citizens do their best. He held up a stern finger as he said this and moved his eyes slowly from one face to the next. Suddenly, Dune spoke up. Pember is not prospering, he cried. Everything is getting worse and worse. Silence, cried the mayor. The blackouts, cried Dune. He jumped from his seat. The lights go out all the time now, and the shortages, there's shortages of everything. If no one does anything about it, something terrible is going to happen. Lena listened with a pounding heart. What was wrong with Dune? Why was he so upset? He was taking things too seriously, as he always did. Miss Thorne strode to Dune and put a hand on his shoulder. Sit down now, she said quietly, but Dune remained standing. The mayor glared. For a few moments, he said nothing. Then he smiled, showing a neat row of gray teeth. Miss Thorne, he said, who might this young man be? I am Dune Harrow, said Dune. I will remember you, said the mayor. He gave Dune a long look and then turned to the class and smiled his smile again. Congratulations to all, he said. Welcome to Ember's workforce, Miss Thorne. Class, thank you. The mayor shook hands with Miss Thorne and departed. The students gathered their coats and caps and filed out of the classroom. Lena walked down the, the wide hallway with Lizzie, who said, Poor you. I thought I picked a bad one, but you got the worst. I feel lucky compared to you. Once they were out the door, Lizzie said goodbye and scurried away as if Lena's bad luck were a disease she might catch. So let's jump over to the character chart and take a look at, at what we could put down for Dune. Because, I mean, it seems like where the rest of these students are kind of trained into accepting their fate, no matter what their fate may be. Dune is not having it, right? He crumpled the paper. He threw it to the floor. Um, he doesn't just, you know, pitch a fit. I mean, he really speaks out against it. He says, Ember's not prospering. Things are getting worse. Uh, he talks about the blackouts. He talks about shortages. He talks about the fear that something might happen. And so with all of this, Dune is expressing some fears that he obviously has. Um, Lena doesn't seem to share them, though, right? Lena says he's taking things too seriously as he always did. She thinks he's kind of overreacting. Uh, but, you know, obviously those concerns are rooted somewhere in reality. And so Dune is not backing down. Even when his teacher comes over and tells him to sit down, he's not going to do it. Dune remains standing. And then, of course, we have this uh, kind of ominous foreboding statement from the mayor I will remember you okay so we'll have to see how that plays out later in the story um and then if you want to jump over to Lizzie um <laughs> she's she's a, a great best friend let me tell you uh I say that with utter sarcasm my dears this is not the kind of friend you want um she tells Lena that she thought she picked a bad one but Lena got the worst Lizzie says I'm lucky compared to you and then she scurried away because Lena's bad luck is a disease she might catch. So that's a nice little metaphorical way of saying that her friend wanted to get away from her quickly because she didn't want to be caught up in Lena's bad mood. Okay, so let's keep going. See what happens. Lena stood at the steps for a moment and gazed across Harkin Square where people walked briskly, bundled up cozily in their coats and scarves, or talked to one another in the pools of light beneath the great street lamps. A boy in a red messenger's jacket ran toward the gathering hall. On Otterwill Street, a man pulled a cart filled with a sack of potatoes, and in the buildings all around the square, rows of lighted windows shone bright yellow and deep gold. Lena sighed. This is where she wanted to be. Up here where everything happened, not down underground. Someone tapped her on the shoulder. Startled, she turned and saw Dune behind her. His thin face looked pale. Will you trade with me? He asked. Trade? 
trade jobs. I don't want to waste my time being a messenger. I want to help save the city, not run around carrying gossip. Lena gaped at him. You'd rather be in the pipeworks. Electrician's helper is what I wanted, Dune said, but Chet won't trade, of course. Pipeworks is second best. But why? Because the generator is in the pipeworks, said Dune. So I want to draw your attention to this keyword generator. Some of you know what a generator is. Um, some of you realize that we had one installed at the middle school this year. Generator is a machine that basically makes electricity. So if you're an electrician's assistant, then obviously you're going to work with the generator, but the location of their generator is in the pipeworks. So this is why for Dune, his top choice was electrician's helper, but pipeworks is his second choice. He actively wants to get involved in the workings of this city and make it better. He's somebody who wants to be proactive, wants to get involved, wants to fix things, okay? And so Lena, who just really doesn't want to be stuck underground all the time, uh, doesn't really understand his, his thought process, okay? Lena knew about the generator, of course. In some mysterious way, it turned the running of the water into power for the city. You could feel its deep rumble when you stood in Plummer Square. So what kind of generator is this if it turns the running of water into the power for the city. Well, if you remember from the escape room, this is what we call hydroelectricity. This is a hydroelectric generator. It turns running water into power, okay? I need to see the generator, Dune said. I have, I have ideas about it. He thrust his hands into his pockets. So, he said, will you trade? Yes, cried Lena. Messenger is the job I want most. And not a useless job at all, in her opinion. People couldn't be expected to trudge halfway across the city every time they wanted to communicate with someone. Messengers connected everyone to everyone else. Anyway, whether it was an important job or not, the job of messenger just happened to be a perfect fit for Lena. She loved to run. She could run forever. And she loved exploring every nook and cranny of the city, which was what a messenger got to do. So this is kind of interesting because it indicates to us that this is their main form of communication with people that are across the city from each other, right? So... Messengers connect everyone to everyone else. So that would mean that there's no phone system. There's no texting. Right? There's no email. There's no snail mail, right? There's no regular mail. So messenger is it. That's all they've got is a person who delivers your message to somebody else, which sounds wildly inconvenient, but... It's the way their society works. And that is the job that Lena wants. And if you imagine somebody who's curious and likes to work with people and wants to be able to run free, it does seem like kind of a perfect job if that's your personality. All right, then, said Dune. He handed her his crumpled piece of paper, which he must have retrieved from the floor. Lena reached into her pocket, pulled out her slip of paper and handed it to him. Thank you, he said. You're welcome, said Lena. Happiness sprang up in her, and happiness always made her want to run. She took the steps three at a time and sped down Broad Street towards home. So the questions I'm left with as a reader are, are they allowed to trade? Because that's the thing. Like, I didn't see Mrs. Thorne or the mayor uh, writing down the jobs that each person got. Um, so if there's no record, then it probably isn't a problem, but if there is a record of this, maybe they, this gets them in trouble, right? And as it is, we know Dune didn't really impress the mayor with his behavior, so, um, that could be concerning. And then, I don't know about you, but my heart is with Dune. I'm curious about what will Dune find? 
because it seems like he's not just going to go down into the pipe works and do what he's told. He's going to be looking around and actively trying to find ways to fix things. Um, and th that might get him into more trouble. So that's a little more interesting, I think, than Lena delivering messages. Um, but, you know, everybody's a different kind of reader. So if you make a connection to Lena and you want to see what kind of gossip is going on in the city of Ember... We'll see. Now, the way this book is structured, just so you know, is we're going to have some chapters that focus on Lena, some that chap chapters that will focus on Dune. Um, so we are very much in a multiple protagonist situation. But I also want you to notice the pronouns that are being used, right? So when Lena's referred to or Dune is referred to, we get them referred to by name and pronoun, which means this is a third person pronoun because we have third person pronouns we have one of two choices in terms of point of view and that would be third person limited or omniscient based on this chapter so far we don't know which it is because we've got only lena's thoughts and feelings represented here right but keep in mind we just read the introduction which was from the perspective of builders of the city of Ember, right? So we had the thoughts and feelings of the builders first before we even met Lena. And what I've just told you is we're going to get some chapters where we're in Dune's perspective. So that means this is not third person limited. Our book is third person omniscient. Omniscient is just a fancy word that means all knowing, okay? So with that in mind, I want you to make sure that you've taken your notes on your character chart. I want you to make sure that you take a look back at the PDF file for introduction in chapter one to find your vocabulary words. See if you can, you know, make a slide on your vocabulary assignment using at least one word from this reading selection. And of course, as always, we will talk about this in our weekly meetings. If you have any questions whatsoever, please make sure that you reach out for me. I am always happy to help. Have a terrific day and I will see you again in the city of Ember.